Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. The Lord has made known his salvation. His righteousness he has revealed in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his mercy and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth in song, rejoice and sing praises. Sing to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of a psalm, with trumpets and the sound of a horn. Shout joyfully before the Lord the King. Let the sea roar and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands, let the hills be joyful together before the Lord. For he is coming to judge the earth. With righteousness he shall judge the world and the peoples with equity. Well, that was Psalm 98. And as you can see, our first hymn this morning is a version of that psalm. It's at the back of the supplement. Psalm 98. Sing to God new songs of worship. All his deeds are marvelous. He has brought salvation to us with his hand and holy arm. Psalm 98 at the back of the supplement. Let us pray. Lord God, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and mercy with those who love him and do his commandments. Our Father, we come before you today and we give you glory for you are the God who made the world and everything in it. We worship you, Lord, through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ who was raised from the dead on this day. We thank you for this weekly celebration of his triumph over Satan, over death and hell, over all of our foes. We thank you, Lord, that he loved us and laid down his life. No one took it from him, but he laid it down of his own will for us and our salvation. And we praise you, Lord, that that death on the cross has taken away all iniquity and brought in everlasting righteousness. Father, we thank you for this great salvation that we have read of and sung of, that you have revealed in the sight of the nations in your Son. We do praise you, Lord, that we have this day to remember him 
especially and to come to you through him together as your people here. Lord, as we do so, we pray that you would pour out upon us the Holy Spirit, the helper, the third person of the Godhead. We do give him glory equal with you, Father and the Son. And we pray that he might enable us to understand the things we are hearing and reading and that he would cause us to remember them and help us to do them. And Lord, right now, he would help us to praise you with all of our hearts. That we would not merely go through the motions. Oh Lord, if this is our usual custom to come to this place and sing these hymns and listen to these sermons and readings, we pray, Lord, that you will help us to fully enter into uh, this act of service. It will be a joyful offering, and an acceptable offering, a sweet-smelling savour. Oh Lord, we thank you for being our God, Father. We thank you that we can praise you as we are now doing. Lord, hear us, have mercy upon us, and do bless each and every soul, whatever our point of need is. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome, everyone, to our first service today. If you are a new student, before you leave, please do take a welcome pack with you from the foyer. And uh, just to say, if you have young children, uh, if they're of pre uh, primary school age and you like them to, they can go to a Sunday school after the second hymn. Uh, if they're younger than that and you wish to go out for any reason, we have a crash room through this door and round to the right. Our evening service is at 6, when I will also be preaching. And at 8 o'clock we have extra time for the young adults at home of the Barclays this week, I believe. I want to just remind you at the close of the service to return your hymn books, supplements and Bibles to the uh, bookshelves in the foyer. We have a few meetings in the week. Uh, starting with Tuesday at 11, there's a ladies' meeting, the speaker being Sue Frampton. All ladies most welcome to attend that meeting in the lecture hall. On Wednesday at half past seven is our midweek meeting. We're hosting a joint prayer meeting with Phillips Street Baptist Church uh, on Wednesday, so please do join us for that. On Friday at 10 o'clock, we have Tiger Tots uh, downstairs, and at slightly earlier time of 5.30, uh, Lighthouse also downstairs. The earlier time is because we have a online prayer meeting being the first Friday of December, uh, half past seven in the evening with our brother Shandor Kellerman from Romania leading us. If you would like the uh, link to that online meeting and I don't have your email address, please do let me know. Uh, on Saturday, uh, 8.30 in the morning, it'll be a men's breakfast at the home of Charles and Julie in Hembury. Please do see myself for more information or for a lift. Uh, and at 7 o'clock in the evening for the ladies, there's a pudding and prayer evening in the home of John and Chris Lewis in Nailsea. Please do see Becky Martin for more info on that. Next Sunday, our services are at the same times of 11 and 6, with myself preaching in the morning and James Martin in the evening. We have a few meetings to let you know about in December. Uh, on the 9th, Saturday the 9th at 11, we have carol singing by the RWA, that's the Royal Western Academy of Art, just down... Uh, near the Triangle in Queen's Road, same road as this. Um, meet at the church half past ten for preparation and prayer, or you can meet us there from 11. That's Saturday the 9th. And Saturday the 16th for the young adults, uh, or indeed young, young people, uh, teenagers as well, uh, it's the Progressive Supper. Uh, that will begin with a meeting here at 5.10, just for transport to the first venue. Please do see John for more info on that, or James. Uh, we do have a lot of carol services over Christmas, as usual. Uh, in fact, a few more than usual. Uh, they're all listed here in the Christmas invitation. There's plenty of copies in the foyer for you to give to any of your contacts. Now our brother Pete, Pete Adams is going to come and speak to the children. Thank you, Pete. and grown-ups. Now for the children, how many of you would like summer all year long? Nice and warm, sunny. I think you'd soon get tired of it, getting too hot. So why do we have change? 
if we have summer all year round, there will be no food for us and no water for us to drink. So we need changes of the seasons. A couple of weeks ago, some people of the church got together and went to a place in Gloucestershire called Western Burt Arboretum, where there's a big park with plenty of trees in it. You may remember seeing a picture when the pastor mentioned it in his talk. And there's some pictures there. The autumn is a good time to go. So, and if you go at the right time in the autumn, you'll be able to see the colours, the different colours of the different leaves on the trees. So why do the trees change colour and why do the leaves drop? Well, the trees, like us, need to rest. After providing shade for us in the summer, in the hot summer months, they get worn out, like we do. They get tired, so they need a rest. And the way they do that to conserve their energy is by shedding their leaves. Though, if we had summer all year, I mentioned we have no food. And in the parable of the sower, we see that. He sowed some seed. It fell on stony ground. It took root, but it didn't survive in the sunshine because there's no depth and no water without food. Like the trees, our behaviour changes. One minute we might be happy, angry, or upset, or sad. Today I'm going to tell you of one person, though, who never changes, nor does his love for us. No matter what we do, he is there at our side as a constant friend, and he is a true and loyal friend to us all. Of course, I'm talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and his love for us. We read in Paul's letter to the Hebrews, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow considering the outcome of your behaviour. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. To be able to get to heaven, we need to have a change in our lives, a change in our behaviour, a change in our attitude and a change in our attitude towards the Bible and towards God. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you are unchanging and you are forever the same and your love, your love for us never changes but is steadfast. Please help us to change our behaviour towards you and to love you more. Amen. Amen. Thank you, you listened well. Our next hymn is number 93 in Christian hymn.
Our Bible reading is Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. In the Church Bible, that's page 876, 876. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, to the end of the chapter, verse 46, let's hear the word of God. The Lord Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for your word, the word of life that fires us, speaks to our souls, and sets our hearts ablaze. Father, we thank you for these parables of the Lord Jesus that we've been looking at. Lord, we thank you that we've come to the end of this series now, and we pray, Lord, that today will be a good end as we conclude with the passage we've just read. We thank you that our Savior spoke all these words. We marvel, Lord, that though he said them so long ago, you have preserved them and caused them to be written down and kept them. You've granted them to us in our own language, translated from the originals. And Lord, we thank you that we are privileged today to hear Jesus himself speak to us, these same words he spoke in the hearing of his disciples 2,000 years ago, we have just heard. And not only that, Lord, we're about to have them opened up to us and applied. We pray, Lord, that as I do this, your Holy Spirit will come upon us, upon the preacher, upon the hearer alike, upon Christian and unbeliever alike. Lord, we pray that he will show us our true state. Lord, that he would take away any self-deception, any pretense, that he would confirm the presence of true faith, O oh Lord, that he would comfort the sheep, as is his name, the comforter. He would come alongside us to encourage us and help us. Lord, to continue in these good deeds of which we have read the fruit of faith 
Lord, we thank you uh, also that he comes to uh, convict those who are not your children, at least those who at present are not your sons and daughters by faith. We pray, O oh Lord, that even today there may be salvation come to this house, that true sons and daughters of Abraham, indeed of God the Father, may be revealed. Father, we thank you that the entrance of your words brings light to our darkened eyes and minds, and we pray it will do that today, Lord. Father, we thank you also for the children who have been with us. Thank you for what they and we have heard in the talk about the changing seasons of life. We thank you for them, Lord, that uh, our year is not boring. We thank you for the variety, and even in this cold winter time, we thank you that uh, it reminds us, Lord, of uh, we appreciate it when the, the spring and the summer come. We thank you for the beauty of the autumn leaves that we have had. And Lord, we thank you as well for the, the light in the middle of uh, the darkness of winter that is Christmas that we are approaching. We thank you, Lord, for this remembrance of your son's first coming to us and all that he did. Thank you, Father, for his humility, his grace to be made poor so that we could become rich. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have very soon to remember these things again and we pray lord that you will be pleased to bless our outreach this christmas we thank you lord for the carol singing at the rwa we thank you for the carol services here we pray lord help us to take these invitations and give them to our own friends we thank you that they have been going out uh, for some weeks now throughout our city many people have had these invites we pray that we will see them lord at these services perhaps they will even be watching now Lord, we pray that you will be glorified in all of this. We ask this, Lord, uh, yes, because we, we love them and are concerned for their eternal welfare, but we desire it most of all that you receive the glory that is due to your name. Because it is not right, O oh Lord, that you, the creator of the world and the judge of all and the savior of mankind should be so dishonored as you are day by day and blasphemed and ignored and rejected. And Lord, we pray that you would forgive us when we sin against you, when we... Lord, do not live up to the light you have shown us when we are unthankful and evil and loveless, though we have been shown such love and grace, graceless, Lord, and unmerciful. Please forgive us, we pray our sins, for Christ's sake, who died for our sins and rose from the dead. Lord, we pray, do have mercy on those dear children, Lord, and do please speak to them now as they have the class together and as they go to their uh, individual classes, Lord, we pray that you'll help those teachers to instruct them uh, at a level appropriate to their age in the things of yourself and that they will remember these things. Lord, we long for these young ones to uh, come forth and confess their faith and be baptized. Lord, we pray for anyone here who is a secret believer, as it were, who has not yet uh, professed their faith openly and submitted to the ordinance of baptism. We pray, Lord, that they will do so and that there may be great rejoicing in this place. Heavenly Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters around the world and indeed closer to home, Lord. We think of those of our own fellowship who are sick and uh, unwell, who are in hospital or confined to home. Lord, we pray for our loved ones. We pray you'll have mercy upon them, that you would raise them up. Lord, we pray for any unconverted loved ones that you will grant our heart's desire and the prayers of many years and do at length, O oh Lord, draw them to yourself. Father, we do pray for our missionary brothers and sisters and thank you for them and particularly for Shandor as we look forward to hearing from him again this coming Friday Lord please bless that time of prayer online we pray that uh, although we will not be in person Lord it will not be any the less uh, edifying and that the prayer will flow freely and that you will answer those prayers we pray Lord God that you bless the ladies meetings this week and the men's breakfast and the, the whole church Bible study thank you for our brethren from Philip Street Please may they be encouraged, Lord, as they assemble with us and we by them. We do pray that uh, you will guide them, Lord, into the, the new year as they have great changes uh, going on there, Lord. And we do pray you will be with them and bless them and cause them to grow. Father, we pray for ourselves that we will grow, not just in quantity. We long to see more people coming in, Lord, and continuing with us. But in quality, more importantly, Lord, that we will be increasingly sanctified and conformed to the image of your dear Son by the spirit he has given to us. Thank you that, Lord, though we are not what we 
could or should be. We are not what we used to be as Christians. We have been redeemed and changed by your spirit within us, working powerfully. And Lord, please help us to carry on serving you this week, wherever we are, whatever we are doing, Lord. May we do it as unto you, for your glory. We pray, gracious God, you will have mercy upon our nation. We thank you for uh, the good things that we know in this land, Lord. We do pray that you will help our leaders to rule wisely, uh, to uphold the rule of law. Nobody would be above that, Lord, not in theory nor in practice. We pray uh, that you will have mercy upon us, Lord, for our many sins. Please turn us from our evil and ungodly ways and our foolish human wisdom. Humble us, we pray, as a nation, that we might seek you once again. And Lord, we pray for other countries also, particularly for Ukraine, where the fighting continues. Lord, we pray that that war will come to a just resolution very soon. Likewise, in Israel and Palestine, we thank you for the release of the hostages. And Lord God, we pray that uh, the terrorists will be eliminated, but that the innocent people on either side of this conflict will be protected, Lord, and that no more loss of life will have to happen amongst them. Lord, we do pray uh, that you will have mercy upon uh, the Jewish people, Lord, that you would open their eyes and show them their Messiah, we pray, especially now at this time of year. Lord, we do thank you for uh, the fellowship of brothers and sisters in this place, of Jew and Gentile, and uh, we do pray that you will build us up in our most holy faith as we declare the praises of you who called us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. Help us then, gracious God, to strengthen us in our work. Please help us, Lord, in the challenges we face. May we know that you're with us every step of the way. And may we avail ourselves of every opportunity to grow in the grace and knowledge of your Son. Lord, help us to attend these meetings this week as we are able. Help us not to make excuses uh, as opposed to genuine reasons why we cannot be there. We pray, Lord, that you will bless us and reward us, not according to our deserts, but according to your great mercy. So, Lord, hear us now, we pray, and pour out your Spirit again, we ask, in, your, in our gathering. For Jesus' sake, amen. Let us sing our third hymn, which is number 282, 282 in Christian hymns. Day of judgment, day of wonders, hark the trumpet's awful sound, louder than a thousand thunders, shakes the vast creation round, how the summons, how the summons, will the sinner's heart confound.
25, verses 31 to 46, page 876 in the Church Bible. Last few months we've been looking at some of the parables of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is a parable? A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning or we could say a simple story with a powerful point. What that point is is not always obvious, deliberately so. We saw in our first sermon in this series that Jesus spoke in parables at least some of his parables, to conceal the truth from the crowds, simultaneously revealing it to his disciples. To them, it was given, he said, by God to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, whereas to others it was not given. And so by means of the parables, some people would fail to see the point, be none the wiser, while as others whom God was calling to himself would be unable to see it. Today we've come to the end of our series, to the last of the parables, or at least the last that we're looking at, to a parable that is arguably not a parable at all. If you notice in the New King James Version in our church Bible, whereas the first two passages are subtitled as parables, the parable of the wise and foolish virgins, the parable of the talents, this one is not. Why not? Why is this not arguably a parable at all? Well, you'll notice, firstly, that the introductory phrase that we usually have in a parable, for the kingdom of heaven is like, is missing. Jesus doesn't say that here at the start. And whereas in the other passages, in those parables, Christ is represented by a fictional character, be it the bridegroom or be it the the Lord going to a far country, here he is explicitly identified by his title, the Son of Man, which is how Jesus usually refers to himself in the Gospel of Matthew. We'll see a little bit more about that title later. So not a fictional character representing him, but his actual title is used here. And thirdly, the events of the other parables are all in the past tense. They're stories, yes, with powerful points to make, pointing to realities. This, though, is in the future tense. It is not a story at all. It is a prophecy, if anything. The scene described is not like the reality. It is the reality that will be one day. This is what will actually happen. When will it happen? When the Lord Jesus Christ comes again at his second coming. All of the parables in this chapter, this passage also, are telling us Friends, how we can be ready for that day, for that momentous event. We've seen from the parable of the virgins that we must be vigilant. Jesus says there in verse 13, Watch therefore, be vigilant, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. We must also be diligent, hardworking, industrious, like the two good and faithful servants of the previous passage. The parable of the talents, not burying our talents in the ground, but trading with them, using them, and thereby gaining more for our master. Vigilant and diligent. Just those two things are challenging enough, aren't they? But in fact, Jesus says there's something else. There's something else. If you and I would be ready for his final return, then we must, in addition to these things, be benevolent. Benevolent. What does that mean? Literally, it means of a good will, with good will, men of good will, kind, caring, compassionate, generous, giving, loving people. That's what we must be. Jonathan Edwards, the American theologian, famously said that heaven is a world of love 
Heaven is a world of love. And only those who love belong there in that world of love. Of such is the kingdom. That is the central lesson of this parable that is not a parable. I think that's plain enough. But let us be sure to notice several important details, nuances, qualifications that are often missed when people read this passage. This is actually a very popular passage amongst uh, people who don't go to church, be they nominal Christians or people who wouldn't say they're Christians at all. They, they like this passage. Why do they like it? Because they think Jesus is teaching here that uh, to go to heaven, all you need to do is be a good person. And the good people go to heaven and the bad people go to hell. There is some truth in that, but it is far from the whole truth. We must look behind the scenes, not just at the rest of the Bible, but even at the details of this passage. Because to believe that we are saved by works, by the good things that we do on the basis of those things, that is a serious misunderstanding of the Bible's message and even of this parable, as I hope to show you. We cannot assume, for one thing, what love is. People speak of love. Yes, love is good. Love is all you need, the Beatles sang. There's a concert in Bristol every so often, isn't there? Like love wins or something like that. But friends, what is love? What actually is it? How does the Son of God define it? We mustn't assume that what our culture calls love and what we might think is loving is actually loving in His sight. And then who are we to love? In particular, who? Because Jesus says, the least of these, my brethren, you did it to them, you did it to me, you did not do it to them, you didn't do it to me. Who are these people? Don't just assume the answer. And most crucially of all, how can we love these people, whoever they are? We might think that we are loving and kind, generous people, but if we're honest, we're very selfish by nature. It doesn't come naturally to us. What is the secret then to true love, to another person-centered life? How can we get to that place? Well, we learn that here. I hope I've whetted your appetite. Are you ready to dive in? Well, let us begin. The scene before us obviously is one of judgment. This is the day of judgment. The subtitle in our version is the Son of Man will judge the nations. The day of judgment. So let us work our way through this passage by noticing three significant features of this judgment. My points are quite lopsided. I'll be spending most time on the second because we cover most of the verses. But even so, let's look at them one by one. Firstly, I want you to notice here in verses 31 to 33 that we have a certain judgment, a sure and certain judgment. Do you believe in a day of judgment? That someday, somehow, human beings are going to give an account for how they've lived and that justice will be done when all is said and done, right will prevail. Do you believe that? Many people, not just Christians, do believe that. Most religions teach in some form or other that after we die, a reckoning awaits us. That we will all face the consequences of our actions, be they good or bad. And even some folk who are not religious, particularly, sense that this is so. Though they cannot explain why, they will sometimes say, well, it will all be right in the end and justice will be done. Of course, there are many others who don't believe this. They would say that when we die, we're beyond the reach of the law even of God's law, because there is no God, and when we die, we simply cease to exist, and that's it. And therefore, the only justice you're ever going to get is in this life, they say. They might even say, oh, look, I could wish it were not so. I wish there was a heaven. I wish there was punishment for the wicked, but the reality is just blackness, oblivion, and all else is just fantasy and wishful thinking. Many people think like that. What, though, does God's word say? What does God's word say? 
Jesus once said to the disciples, who do men say that I am? And they gave him the, the popular answers of the day, but he said, who do you say I am? And the answer that Peter gave was ultimately from God. Because what God thinks about any subject is what matters. God says it, that settles it. And we should believe that. So what does the Bible say? Well, Scripture is crystal clear that there is going to be a day of reckoning, a day of judgment. That God will judge the earth. He has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. He has appointed such a day. A calendar day, it will occur. And the Old Testament teaches this, and the New Testament teaches this. One of the most clear passages is this one. The words of Jesus himself in his earthly ministry. He begins, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Well, there's a lot right there. A lot to note. This title again, the Son of Man. Jesus usually refers to himself like this, but it actually comes from the book of Daniel, the Old Testament book, Daniel chapter 7, which is actually another passage, like I mentioned, speaking of the great day of judgment. The Son of Man comes and receives authority from the Most High, the Ancient of Days, God the Father, to judge, receives his kingdom. Of course, it points to Jesus' real humanity. He is a Son of Man, but it's also because of the background in Daniel, a divine title. This is no mere man. This is the God man who comes near to the ancient of days. He can do that because he is himself divine. He will come in his glory, in his majesty, in his splendor, his brilliance, his radiance, shining like the sun, brighter than the sun. And all the holy angels with him, they are awesome in their own right, but before the king of the angels their brilliance fades into the background like the stars disappear when the sun rises. Nevertheless, they are holy and awesome. They are his servants who will do his bidding and gather these people as we'll see in a minute. These are the good angels, the elect angels who did not fall into sin like Satan's angels that we read of later, preserved by God's grace from entering into his rebellion. And then he will sit on the throne of his glory. There's this great high throne. The throne of his glory. This position of authority. Of royalty. That's why he's called the king in verse 34. He sits on the throne. But it's also a judgment seat. In our country the king has no judicial authority. But in the Bible and kings do. And Christ the king is also the judge. God will judge the world through the man he has ordained, this man, the Son of Man, his own Son, Jesus Christ. Now notice the confidence with which Jesus speaks here in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory. Not if, but when. And not perhaps he will sit on the throne of his glory. He might do. Then. He will sit on the throne of his glory. It's going to happen, Jesus says. And also this will happen, verse 32. All the nations will be gathered before him. Every single human being who has ever lived through time and space. This is a universal judgment. You know, we have a, a sort of a universal court in this country, the international court in this world, the international court of human rights. And from time to time, various tyrants whose time has come have to appear before that court, but others don't. But in this judgment, it really will be universal. Nobody will be absent. No one will be exempt. Nobody will be able to say, stay in their cell and say, I'm not coming, as they could do in this country till recently. No, everyone will come. We must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Even the dead, friends. The dead will be raised. And having been raised, they shall be judged. Don't think you can escape by death. And that the law cannot reach you. Man's law may not be able to beyond the grave. But God's most certainly can. He will judge the living and the dead. 
All the nations will be gathered before him. The angels will be doing that. And having gathered us, he shall separate us. Jesus says, and he will separate them one from another. As a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats, and he will set the sheep on his right hand, which for the Jews was the the side of of blessing and favor. Benjamin was the son of the right hand, literally the son of Jacob. Uh, And the left hand, not necessarily a bad thing, but certainly relatively not as good as the right hand. And in this context, very ominous indeed. The goats on the left and the sheep on the right. It's these two verses, by the way, and this imagery of sheep and goats and shepherd, this is why it's been called a parable at all, because of that imagery which we have in the other parables. But as I say, this is real. These are not really sheep or goats, of course. They are human beings. But in the Bible, God's people are often referred to and likened to as sheep. And the Lord is the great shepherd ruler who protects them and watches over them. There is nothing inherently wrong with goats, to be sure, that they should stand for the wicked. Goats were not unclean animals to the Jews. They were even offered to God in sacrifice. They're simply used here to distinguish between those who are God's people and those who are not, between he who serves him and he who does not serve him. The point really is that as surely as any shepherd knows the difference between his animals and his flock, so Christ can discern between the righteous and the wicked. His judgment is all-encompassing, but it is not indiscriminate. Far from it. Friends, do you not see that for justice to be done, separation must happen? It happens in our legal system. The judges distinguish between those who are guilty and those who are innocent, or at least the juries do, between the just and the unjust. And we even recognize degrees of guilt. There's murder, there's manslaughter, there's unlawful killing, there's causing or allowing. How much more shall the Lord make right distinctions? Abraham said, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Of course he shall. His holy angels shall be his assistants. As Jesus said in another parable, the parable of the dragnet, which we overlooked. Chapter 13, verse 49. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth and separate the wicked from among the just. Once again, please notice, this is the real point I'm making. The certainty of all of this, the authority also with which Christ speaks, the nations, not may, they will be gathered. He will separate them. He will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Friends, to believe otherwise, that's the fantasy. Jesus knows what he's talking about. He is the faithful and true witness. He is the firstborn from the dead. He's the ruler over the kings of the earth. They'll all be there too before him. He's king of kings and lord of lords. He knows what he's talking about. He's speaking the truth. Are you looking forward to Christmas? don't know if you've done your shopping already. Maybe you've, uh, like my sister-in-law, been very efficient and sent your Christmas cards already. Uh, maybe you haven't even, hasn't even crossed your mind to go Christmas shopping yet, but uh, you will be probably soon. You probably like Christmas, certainly if you're a Christian. Most Christians enjoy observing the birth of our Lord, though it's not commanded in the Bible. It's a wonderful opportunity to do so. Brightens, warms the cold winter, cold dark winter, as I said. We probably love Christmas. You believe in Jesus' first coming, certainly. As a believer, you You love to hear of all Jesus did and said in the Gospels. Well, friends, this is in the Gospels too. The second coming of Christ. We forget this. There's not enough emphasis on this. Believe in his first coming. You believe in his first coming. Believe also in his second. He was born in great poverty. Laid in the manger. He will return in majestic glory. Seated on his throne. He was crucified in weakness by lawless men. He will come in power to judge those same sinners. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Yes, he will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom.
That's when the kingdom of God will come in its fullness. He's already started it now in the hearts of his people, you, we all, who are Christians. But then the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. So there is a certain judgment, you see. And this is good news. This is wonderful news. Evil will be punished. And that's why in Psalm 98, as we began with, and also Psalm 96, the psalmist envisages and summons the whole creation, trees, valleys, fields, and woods, and rivers, everything to rejoice before the Lord because he's coming to judge the earth. And actually in Psalm 96, it says it twice, for he is coming, for he is coming. Again, the certainty. He is coming. Shouldn't we rejoice with them? Should you not rejoice today at the reminder that Christ is coming again to judge the world in righteousness? Well, it depends, I suppose. Because we are the ones who are going to be judged. It's not just going to be other people. It's not just going to be the people who our justice system has judged and the great dictators of the world. No, it's going to be you and me too. And so we can rejoice in the second coming and the prospect of it if we're ready for it. Am I ready for it? That's the question we each need to be asking. And how can I be ready for it then? How can I know I'm ready for it? Or how can I become ready for it if I know I'm not? Because this judgment is certain. That's the first point. Well, let's answer that question by looking secondly at a righteous judgment. Verses 34 to 45, the majority of the rest of the passage. Justice is vital. It's crucial. Every nation on earth has a justice system of some sort. A country simply cannot function without one. Some are better than others, but even the best of them, it has to be admitted, are flawed. And miscarriages of justice perhaps even often occur course of justice is perverted through a bribe or uh, through false testimony or sometimes just through honest mistake is that also possible on the day of judgment will the king in some cases get it wrong absolutely not perish the thought friends this is going to be a righteous judgment a just judgment and how can I be so sure? Because we already have the transcript of the proceedings right here. We know that the king, the king's words, which are recorded for us in advance, this is prophecy, they begin positively. He begins positively, verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, to the sheep, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. What a beginning. Wonderful words those are. And I do think there's probably something in the fact that Jesus chooses to begin with the sheep that indicates his loving nature. As the Puritans said, judgment is his strange work. He would much rather bless than curse. To Abraham he said, he who blesses those who bless you, I will bless. And he who curses you, I will curse. Blessing comes first and it's also in the plural. Singular second and it's in the uh, cursing second and it's in the singular. His nature is to bless and have mercy. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. We'll come back to that verse in due course, because it's vital, actually, that uh, 34th verse to rightly understand this, par this passage. But for now, let's move on. Why should these people enter the kingdom? These folk on his right hand. Jesus says, verse 35, For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Here, he is speaking in the past tense and of himself. So we might conclude, surely he is referring to his first coming, his earthly life and ministry in the land of Israel to people who gave him a meal and uh, visited him. But then do we read of such things in the Bible? Did Jesus ever get sick and somebody went to see him? 
he was in prison for a while before he was taken to his show trial, but did anybody see him then? There's no record. It's because he's not talking about that, as we'll see. But the sheep are confused. He also can't be speaking about that because, remember, this is all the nations before him, not just people who were in Israel and people who were not even alive at the time Jesus was on earth. So we cannot be talking about his earthly life and ministry and what people did to him then. And the sheep are confused. They say, verse 37, the righteous, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? When did we ever do this to you, Lord? As far as we can recall, we didn't. And notice, that's important there. This is one of those nuances people miss, the humility of these people. They're not boastful. They're not saying, of course, yes, I must have done something like that. that that's just the sort of person I am. Because, though they can't really remember it happening. They're not proud. They're, they're confused. They're humble, and, and it's not a false humility. They're genuinely puzzled. They're bamboozled by Jesus' statement. And so the Lord enlightens them. Here is the... Here is the, the key that unlocks the riddle. Verse 40, And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it, clothing, feeding, giving to drink, visiting, to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So, who are Jesus' brethren? Who are his brothers and sisters? Is it everyone? Is it all people? That's often assumed to be the case by people who just know this passage and don't read the Bible carefully. The Bible certainly says we should do good to all. Is it the Jewish nation? Is it Israelites? Jesus was Jewish. Certainly they are his brethren, his kinsmen according to the flesh. But is that what he means here? Some Christians who do take their Bibles very seriously think that. But I believe there can be no doubt as to the correct answer. Because Jesus himself poses, poses and answers this question earlier in the Gospel. Chapter 12, verse 48. But he answered and said to the one who told him, that your mother Mary and your brothers James and the others, that they come looking for you. He said to him, who is my mother? And who are my brothers? Who are they? Same question I'm asking. Who are these my brethren? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. It's not despising his physical family. He loved them very deeply. And yes, the disciples there were all Jews, but this applies to Gentiles too. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven, you can be a non-Jew and you can do that. So if that's the case, you are a brother of Christ and you are the people he's talking about here. It's his disciples, it's all his disciples, but especially those who, like these first disciples, the apostles, were sent by him into the world, into the nations, to the nations, to proclaim to them the glorious gospel of grace. In an even earlier passage, Matthew chapter 10, Jesus said, do you remember, in verse 40, to the apostles, those first disciples, he who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, and he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. Assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. This, friends, Matthew chapter 25, is that. Matthew chapter 10. Christ is keeping his promise. What the sheep have done to them, the least of his brethren. Yes, what they've done to each other. 
but especially to those who are called to preach the gospel. They've ministered to them. They've received spiritual blessings from them and they're ministering physical blessings back to them. What the sheep have done to each other, they have done to their Lord and Savior. When he was hungry, they fed him. When he was thirsty, they gave him to drink. When he was naked, they clothed him. When he was a stranger, they took him in. When he was sick and when he was jailed, they went to see him because they did that to their brothers and sisters. Though it was the least, the least Christian, the worst preacher, perhaps the Christian most unsanctified and very poor in their knowledge and the application of that knowledge, yet a true believer when they did it to them, to the least of them, they did it to the best, to the greatest, to the king. It's fitting, therefore, that they enter his kingdom. What, do you, what it, was it Jesus said in the Beatitudes? Matthew 5, verse 7. We go even further back, Matthew's gospel. Blessed are the merciful. Why? For they shall obtain mercy. Again, this is that. This is nothing else than that. What about, what about the questions a friend of mine raised, which is that how, how can... Uh, how can we, we read this parable? We know this parable, and then if this is actually going to happen, you know, because we've read this parable, we should know what's going to happen, and then how can we be surprised, uh, as the sheep are, uh, when the Lord says, you did it to me, and they say, Lord, when did we do it to you? Do, do you see the point my friend was raising? How can we be surprised when we've already read this parable and we know this will happen? And I think my only response to that conundrum is that the sight of the king will be so indescribably and amazingly glorious that we'll be so taken up with the sight of him. We just won't be able to fathom, even though we, we know this, that the people we ministered to, it was actually to this one on the throne. You, you went to see that little old lady in hospital. You thought it was just that little old lady. It was the king of glory. But you didn't. When you see the king in his beauty, you, you, you forget what you did because you're so taken up with the sight of him. You forget this parable for a moment. When the king says, the solution, you remember it. That's my solution to my friend's puzzle, whatever you think of that. What about the goats, though? On what basis or principle will they be judged? It's exactly the same. Verse 41, then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me. You cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. The demons, those angels who fell with him in the rebellion against God. And why? It's the flip side, isn't it? It's the reverse. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And it's instructive, the different attitude revealed in verse 44. Then they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? These people are proud. They're puffed up. They're self-righteous. They, they think, oh, surely we would have done that because, you know, we're good people. But no, they didn't do it. Assuredly, I say to you, and as much as you did not do it to one of the least of these, to Christ's disciples, to the sheep, to the least of them, you did not do it to me. It's no good, my friends, showing mercy to all and sundry, but hating Christians. You hate Christians, you hate Christ. You slander God's servants, you slander him. That they are the apple of his eye. I'm not saying he doesn't care about the others. I'm not saying you shouldn't do good to other people. But if you, if you don't love the Lord's people, woe to you. Woe to you. Will there be any injustice on the last day? No. That day, rather, will be the end of all wrong. 
by means of a righteous judgment, the righteous judgment of God. Judgment not on appearance, but on truth, not on hearsay, but on what the Lord has seen. Everything hidden shall be made known, he says. Not on fair words, but on good deeds. Now, this raises another question. You may be thinking, particularly if you're a Christian, an evangelical Christian, where is the gospel, the evangel in all of this? Good deeds. There's none who does good. No, not one. There is none righteous. We've all sinned, haven't we? And we're saved not by works, but by grace. As Paul says, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, you're not wrong. But neither is Jesus here. No, the scripture does not teach that we are saved by works. That is on the basis of or for the merit of our good deeds. We cannot earn heaven. That's a very surface reading of this passage. A very isolated reading of this chapter, disregarding everything else the Bible teaches, but also, as I'm about to show, an insufficiently attentive reading of the passage itself. Jesus shows us in verse 34 the underlying reason, the real reason why these people are going to heaven. Come, he says, you blessed of my Father. You blessed of my Father. Jesus used that phrase earlier in the gospel of a man. I actually alluded to it, referred to it earlier. Do you remember who he was? Simon Peter. And why did Jesus say he was blessed? Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, Matthew 16, 17, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. What's the this? Peter perceived that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Not of his own ingenuity, not from his own will or spirituality, or superior discernment or morality, but by the gift of Almighty God. He was saved by grace, and so are these people. They're blessed by God. This kingdom that has been prepared for them has been prepared before the foundation or from the foundation of the world. That is from, from eternal years. Before they were born, before they did any good or evil, God has set his love upon them. These good works that they have indeed been doing, he has prepared for them to do, that they should walk in them, Ephesians 2.10. So they can't boast in them, and they don't, as we saw. And perhaps even this word inherit the kingdom you don't earn an inheritance when a loved one or a relative dies and bequeaths, leaves their money to you. It's entirely of their will what they give to whoever they want to. And if you've received an inheritance, it was a gift of grace. So you see, there's a lot in that verse that rightly helps us understand and this parable does not conflict with the scriptural teaching that we're saved by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. We're not saved by works, brothers and sisters. We will, however, be judged by them. Judgment is according to works. Even Paul says so. Romans 2 and other places. Why is judgment according to works? Because our actions reveal our faith. Or lack thereof. They're not the root. They're the fruit. They're the evidence. And in any good courtroom, you need evidence. You need proof. This is that proof. As we saw in the previous passage in the parable of the talents, why did the good servants trade? It was because, why, why were they? Because they had good hearts. They were faithful, heart, faithful, believing hearts. They trusted their Lord and they loved him and they looked for his coming. They realized he had been gracious to them in giving them what he had given them. Whereas the evil servant, that was his problem. He had an evil heart of unbelief. That's why he was lazy. He didn't love his Lord. He didn't believe him. You see, how we treat one another matters, friends. We mustn't say, just love your neighbor as yourself. You can also say, I must love my brother as my Lord. Because whatever I do to my brother or sister in this church and in wherever I meet true Christians, whatever I say about them, whatever I think about them, whatever I do to them or do not do, notice the, the, the goats are not condemned in this case for actual things they did, but for what they didn't do, sins of omission. How we treat one another matters. When you judge your brother, 
you judge Christ, when you despise your brother, you despise Christ, would you avoid Christ? Would you refuse to talk to him? And don't do it to them. Love one another as I have loved you. I suspect we all need to repent in the light of this passage this morning. That we also need to carry on doing the good that we have been doing, however little that may be. And there's a lot that goes on in this fellowship. I should know. It gladdens my heart when I see brothers and sisters loving one another. When I hear of somebody making a meal for somebody else and taking it to them or coming to see them. It shows me that my labor is not in vain, that it's having an effect. And it was no doubt the case before I came, but it's still happening. Thomas Akempis said, we will not be judged by what we've read, but by what we've done, by what we did. Put your faith into action. Don't leave it all up here. Show it. Prove that you're a sheep. How can you do that? The Holy Spirit, don't you know, has been given to you. Walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You'll do the works of faith. Faith works by love. My very last point, and just a word or two on this, I promise, because it's just one verse. We've seen a certain judgment. We've seen a righteous judgment. An eternal judgment. Everlasting. Verse 46. And these will go away into everlasting punishment. The goats, that is. Those on the left. But the righteous into eternal life. The righteous will hear the word come. You notice, come. In verse 34, it's the first word they hear. Everything is in that one word, really. Come. Jesus wants them. He beckons them to him. Contrarywise, the goats hear that awful word, go. Verse 41, depart. The opposite. Jesus doesn't want them near him. He doesn't want them in his kingdom for the reasons we've seen. Because of their unbelief manifested by their lack of good works. Go to where? Come to where? To an eternal heaven for the sheep or to an everlasting hell for the goats. It's the same Greek word you may know in verse 46 translated in by two different English words but same Greek word heaven and hell are couldn't be more different from one another but they have this in common they last equally as long if heaven is if hell is just for a time you can get out of hell eventually like purgatory you paid your dues you can go to heaven then if hell is temporary then so is heaven but they're both eternal there'll be no appeal you can make on the day of judgment you won't be able to appeal to a higher court and say i want this reconsidered we're so you know people in our system they get lots of chances to appeal but not here there's no point because the judgment is unerringly just don't think you can have an appeal then dear friend your only appeal is now to the king who offers you his mercy his pardon his grace his forgiveness the king who himself somehow on the cross suffered eternal hell when the sky turned black and the sun was obscured and he cried out my god my god why have you forsaken me he went through all of that to save us i was just thinking yesterday we were doing safeguarding training and there was a, a little video about a boy who becomes a, a ne'er-do-well a criminal and i was just imagining if i had done some awful deed and i was facing the death penalty in another country and someone came to me and comforted me and um, I thought they were just comforting me, but then I later learned I was being let free. And when I f asked the reason why, I found out this person had taken that penalty for me. The, the judgment hadn't just been thrown out, because that would not be right. But he had suffered the, the ultimate penalty in my place. And I just thought, I'd be so grateful for that person, I'd live the rest of my life with them. 
course that has happened far beyond that in a greater way he suffered eternal death somehow the son of God in his eternal divine nature but also as a human being dying in my place and he's done this so that whoever responds to the good news if you respond to it now you may not be a Christian till now you respond to his gospel now you will be saved because of what he has done that's the merit his righteousness given to you that is what leads to the righteousness worked in you by the spirit as we see in this passage that's the foundation on which all else rests but if you reject this appeal then your appeal process has been exhausted and you're facing everlasting punishment I can't even begin to describe I don't know how awful that will be but I know that if you go there you will never get out at all costs come to Christ don't let anything stop you nothing at all everything rests upon this everything if you go there all is lost every every act in your life is ultimately of no significance you don't have to you don't have to so don't God is offering you his mercy today repent of your sins trust in the Lord Jesus believe he's the son of God and he died and rose again trust in him you will be saved you'll be a sheep not a goat you'll have an eternal world of joy a world of love to go to it will never ever end as one old saint said in heaven the saint shall live as long as God himself eternal judgment I called my series on the parables things kept secret because that's how the Bible describes them. But to you, my friends, they've been revealed. You've heard these things. Do you have ears, though? Spiritual ears to hear. Don't let this be like the seed that the birds gobbled up. Don't let it be like the seed that fell on stony ground, as we heard. And it sprang up immediately, but ultimately came to nothing. Don't let it be like the seed among thorny weeds that choked it slowly but surely may your heart today be like that good seed whether you bring forth 30 or 60 or 100 fold do it as unto the Lord and not to men whoever has ears to hear let him hear Amen we'll close by singing number 54 from the supplement Number 54, rejoicing in hope, we wait for our King. His coming is sure, his conquest we sing. His hour of returning draws daily more near. With hearts hushed and burning, we see him appear. 54.
Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Amen.